So this is Grow. Um, what is this series about? This series is about uh, kind of refocusing and redefining what the mission and the vision here is at Heart of the City. So we're just taking some time at the beginning of the year to really dial in this is what we are about. Now, our mission statement is and always has been to be a people after God's own heart. Can you guys say that with me? To be a people after God's own heart. Yes, you guys are on it. Um, that, it, it always has been. But recently we decided, we've been, um, we've been doing some different researching and learning. Of course, hopefully we're always learning and growing. Um, but we really wanted to, to, to set aside this time to define what we mean by that. It's a beautiful saying. I think it, it, it definitely evokes emotion, you know, to be a people after God's own heart. It's, it's, of course, referring to the way that Scripture describes King David, the only person in Scripture that was ever described as a man after God's own heart. So we want to be a people after God's own heart. But we wanted to flesh that out a little bit. And so with the help of um, a guy named Chris Hodges and a church in Birmingham, Alabama called the Church of the Highlands, which if you don't, if you haven't heard about them, you should look it up, um, we borrowed of some of, their, some of their material, and it really resonated with us. And so we have decided to define and what to be a people after God's own heart means to us is four statements. Do you guys remember that from last week? What's the first one? No, no God. Yes. Second one? Find freedom. You guys are on it. Third one? <laughs> now, listen. You should be grateful. Yeah. They, they are making you look so good right now. <laughs> they are making you look so good. And, and, and finally, so we have know God, find freedom, discover purpose, and make a difference, right? That is how we are defining to be a people after God's own heart. I, I, and I, I, wanna, I wanna let you guys know that those four statements didn't come out of thin air. It wasn't, it wasn't like it was just randomly like, that's, that's what it is. Those, those four statements actually come from a scripture from Ephesians chapter one. And so um, I want to read that tonight, and I want to kind of break it down how those four pieces exist within Ephesians chapter 1. So a little bit of context, because I personally don't write like reading Scripture very often without giving context before. So these are the words of Paul. This is a letter to the church of Ephesus, and this specific section is like the greeting, hey, how you doing section. He's like saying, I love you guys. You guys are killing it. Here's something that I'm praying for you about. <clears throat> so we're going to start in... So it's Ephesians chapter 1, verse 17 and 18. I keep asking that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that you may know him better. Know God, right? You see it? It's there. You may know him better. He also says, I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened. This one takes a little bit more to move back over, but your, the eyes of your heart may be enlightened, that you might find, that you might see that, that the freedom and the victory of Christ might be revealed to you, that you might find freedom. Going on, in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you, that you might discover your purpose. The riches of his glorious inheritance in his holy people. What is our glorious inheritance? That is God's kingdom. And we are a part of God's kingdom making a dent more than a dent, transforming this world, turning it upside down. Amen? That is the difference that we are making. And so I just thought it was cool. I didn't even realize that until recently. Oh, my goodness, this is based on a scripture, and now I love it even more. So tonight we're going to talk about the first statement, and that is to know God, to know God. And I want to I tackle this topic by asking two questions. Um, I, I recognize that my shirt is a little bit like it's the whole, I was planning to preach in my jacket tonight. While we were worshiping, I was getting so into it, I was sweating so bad that I, d I had to take it off. So um, don't be distracted by my shirt. <laughs> it feels a little bit, I'm not used to, I'm not used to the you, like, I, like my clavicles are showing. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> uh, <clears throat> So we're going to tackle this topic tonight by asking two questions. The first question, why is it so important for us to know God and to help others know God? Okay, that's the first one. It's kind of two-part, but it's one. Secondly, how can we practically do these things? I'm going to say that again just because I know that you were distracted by my clavicles. Why? 
why is it so important for us to know God and to help others know God? And how can we practically do these things? To answer these questions, or at least to address them, I want to look at two passages of Scripture. One of them is going to be from John 17, and one of them is going to be from Luke 15. Both Gospels, both primarily, almost every word that I'm going to read from Scripture tonight is going to be the words of Jesus. So, before I read Scripture, what do I need to give? Context. All right. John 17 is a prayer. Almost the entire, the entire text is a prayer that Jesus was praying on the night that he would be betrayed and he knew that he was about to be crucified. And it gives us a, a poignant picture, I would say. Poignant. I don't know if that's a very relatable word. I like the word. It gives us a powerful, strong. It gives us a strong picture of what Jesus' desire was and is for believers. Okay, so we're going to start in verse 1. We're going to read verses 1 through 3. Then we're going to skip a few and we'll read 23 through 26. Okay? Verse 1, when Jesus had spoken these words, he lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son, that the Son may glorify you, since you have given him authority over all flesh to give eternal life to all whom you have given him. This is where, so sometimes I need to read more than just the scripture that I want you to hone in on because I, wanna, I want you to see where that scripture is sitting. But now for verse 3 is where I want you to hone in. This is what I really want to say, okay? And this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. Okay? We skip a few down to verse 22. The glory that you have given me, I have given to them that they may be one even as we are one, I and them and you and me, that they may become perfectly one so that the world may know that you sent me and love them even as you love me. Father, I desire that they also whom you have given me may be with me where I am to see my glory that you have given me because you loved me before the foundation of the world. O righteous Father, even though the world does not know you, I know you, and these know that you have sent me. I made known to them your name, and I will continue to make it known that the love with which you have loved me may be in them and I in them. There's a lot there. We're not going to try to cover it all. But if you haven't read John 17 lately, let it transform your entire paradigm on what it means to be a believer. We're going to skip to now to Luke chapter 15, which actually, I mean, if you look at it in a Bible, it's going backwards. So, but... Anyway, and chronologically as well, because this is a little bit more before when Jesus died. So. Um, uh, context, Luke 15 is a pretty famous passage in which Jesus tells three stories, okay? Three parables, parables. We don't really use that term. They're example stories. Um, they're illustrations in order to kind of um, get at a deeper principle, right? So he tells three stories. All these three stories are specifically about lost things being found, Right? Probably starting to ring a bell. You guys are going to start to pick up like what those three things are. If, you know. um, so according to our understanding, Jesus had just been at a meal at a Pharisee's house. What is a Pharisee? What a strange word. It's basically a Jewish religious leader of the day. Okay, So when we use that, when they say the Pharisees and the scribes, these religious leaders who, for, for all intents and purposes in the New Testament, were kind of jerks, to be real. They, they, they were very judgmental and kind of had missed the point, even though they were kind of the pastors of the day. Yikes. Um, they had really, really missed it. Let that be a warning to the church. <clears throat> okay, context. Jesus was on his way to Jerusalem, and after exiting the home of this Pharisee, we don't know exactly how long, Craig probably knows exactly how long, I couldn't pick it up from reading the scriptures, but he is then surrounded by tax collectors and sinners. Okay, don't let that term throw you. I'm not talking about the IRS. That's a legitimate job being in the IRS, you know, but for, for, for biblical understanding in the New Testament, when we see tax collectors and sinners, please remove the, like the idea of the IRS. Now, I know you might not like the IRS to come tax time if you don't have a good tax return, but it's a legitimate job and they're doing, they're doing great things. But tax collectors in the New Testament were known as people who cheat people. They were known as dishonest people. They wouldn't only take the tax which was owed, they would also have a little on the side. Do you understand what I mean? So when you see the term tax collectors and sinners, please Think about it as this. They were the morally corrupt of the day, and they were the people that self-righteous people would look down on. Does that make sense? So these religious leaders are dissing on Jesus for hanging out with the morally corrupt, like they do. And Jesus, with these three stories, not only rebukes these religious leaders. He does a lot of rebuking through stories. I, I like Jesus. He's, he can be a little passive-aggressive, but it's in a holy way. So... <laughs> 
Seriously, I mean, a parable is kind of passive aggressive, but it's like, holy, so whatever he does is cool. So that doesn't give you permission to be passive aggressive. Don't hear what I'm not saying. <laughs> don't, don't do it. And don't email me about that. Or don't, and don't email my dad, he's on sabbatical, leave him alone. So he simultaneously rebukes these religious leaders, and at the same time, he is giving us this amazing insight into the heart of the Father, okay? So he's rebuking and bringing revelation at the same time. Craig's done that in my life. I don't know why I'm referring to you so often. I'll try to, I'll try to switch it up. But Craig has rebuked me and brought revelation to me, and at the same time, I'm telling you, there's something really beautiful about the wounds of a friend. Open rebuke is better than hidden love. And you can be transformed by a rebuke and come to a new revelation about the truth. I'll leave that there. All right, so verse one in uh, Luke chapter 15. Now the tax collectors and sinners were all drawing near to him and the Pharisees and the scribes grumbled saying, this man receives sinners and eats with them. So he told them this parable. What man of you having a hundred sheep, if he has lost one of them, does not leave the 99 in the open country and go after the one that is lost until he finds it? And when he has found it, he lays it on his shoulders rejoicing. And when he comes home, he calls together his friends and his neighbors saying to them, rejoice with me for I have found my sheep that was lost. Just so I tell you, now listen very closely to the word choice here. There will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who need no repentance. More joy. Or what woman having 10 silver coins, if she loses one coin, does not light a lamp and sweep the house and seek diligently until she finds it? And when she has found it, she calls together her friends and neighbors saying, rejoice with me for I found the coin that I had lost. Just so I tell you, there's joy before the angels of God over one sinner who repents. Repent. Please pray with me. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you that it has been read and therefore truth has been spoken. Lord, we pray that you would reveal your heart to us tonight that you would show us how much you want us to know us, how much you want us to know you, and how much you want us to be a part of other people knowing you. We love you, Lord. We commit this time. Lord, I pray that everything that is your truth would sink deep into the hearts of people, and everything that is just nonsense from my flesh would fall to the ground. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Every, everything that is nonsense fall to the ground. Amen. And get deleted from Facebook Live. <laughs> so, <clears throat> Christmas Eve, three years ago, setting the scene, um, we had church here. It was a Christmas Eve, it was, it was a Christmas Eve gathering. And then um, we left, and I, we went straight to my mother in law's for Christmas Eve, and we stayed the night. And then the next morning, I, um, we were leaving, and I realized that I did not have my wallet, and I could not find it. And, um, and I was distraught because wallets have important things inside them, right? They have credit cards and identification, and identification also usually is a driver's license, so that's very inconvenient. And um, membership cards, my wife has tons of loyalty cards, very important to her. Um, <laughs> so I remember, I remember just just frantically searching the house, frantically searching my car, double, triple, quadruple checking every pocket of every jacket and every pair of pants. I didn't have that many with them because I was staying at someone's house and it was only in a suitcase, but nevertheless, I was searching very diligently and becoming increasingly anxious as I was unsuccessful in finding my wallet. And my family members were doing fine, um, you know, helping. Um, they, they looked in some places and like consoled me and was like, it'll turn up. You know, um, you know, like just, it was kind and everything, but if you've ever been in that situation, like you just want someone to get how you are feeling about, about your lost item, right? You're just like, you're like, yeah, thanks. It's not your wallet. Thanks for the consoling. It'll turn up. It's fine from your end. I have to cancel everything and then get new ones of everything. And I can't drive until that happens. And really... I mean, a wallet isn't even a big deal. I'm not a parent yet, but some of you parents I know have lost your children places. No condemnation. You don't have to raise your hand. You don't have to raise your hand, but I've heard of parents talking about it, okay? 
Um, I think my parents probably lost me in some context before, but it wasn't catastrophic enough for me to remember it and be scarred forever. But I think a lot of times it goes something like this. You know, you go up to like an employee or a security guard or something, which is an employee, and uh, you're like, this is the situation, everything, and they're just like, it'll be fine. Um, do you remember the last place you saw them? And you're going, I will wipe that blank patronizing look right off your face if you don't get with the program right now and help me find my kid. And it just seems like they just don't get it, right? People don't get it unless it's not their kid. And so they're like, I have my job and I have my other things to do. And you are really distracting me right now with your problem. <laughs> and... And while others are putting out this marginal effort, they might like call of intercom like, hey, I mean, if you're a child and you're lost, there's a parent, <laughs> you know? And you're just going, you can do better than that. Yeah. While others are putting out marginal effort, you are captivated, completely captivated and occupied by the search. There's, there's nothing that's going to like, you have tunnel vision at that point. You're like, I'm going to find my child. We believe at Heart of the City Church, that God is captivated and occupied by the search for his lost children. And because of that, and because of that, we have decided to dedicate our lives to be occupied and captivated by that same search. If you've been with us for any extended period of time, you will probably have noticed that when we do church, whatever that means, the way we do church is pointed at seeking and saving the lost. We build and shape our weekend gatherings like this one for the primary purpose, not the only purpose, but the primary purpose of seeing people who have never known God come into relationship with him for the first time or those who have known God and have walked away from him come back into relationship with him, okay? If you didn't know that, now you know. Now, don't hear what I'm not saying, okay? We want Heart of the City to be a place where believers can grow and mature and go deep in the things of the Lord, okay? And we will continue to, we will continue to facilitate ways for that to happen, okay? We're, we're going to continue pressing into that. We are not going to sacrifice depth for breadth. We're not going to make the river shallow in order that it would spread wider. We don't have to, and here's why. Because sometimes we think like, Oh, no, they're going to start being seeker-sensitive. No, we, you know, sometimes I think that seeker-sensitive, seeker-sensitivity seeker comes from a misunderstanding of what lost people need and what lost people want. We make everything so surfacey and fake, and we're like, this is what lost people want. No, they don't. Lost people need to be in the manifested presence of God so that their hearts can be ripped out. And so they can be changed. So it's not secret sensitivity. It's being obsessed with what God is obsessed with. Yeah, get it. Okay. Woo. Yeah. All right. So we're... Yeah. We're... <laughs> we're intently focused on chasing after loss because that is exactly how Jesus describes the heart of the Father. Let's go back to Luke 15, okay? He sends an unmistakable message with three different stories that define the focus of the father. God leaves the 99 sheep and the nine coins and the well-behaved brother. I know I didn't do the prodigal son story, but you guys know it. The well-behaved brother and search for the one. And heaven rejoices more over one lost person being found than in the multitude who are already righteous. Sometimes we read that scripture and we go, oh, he rejoices more in just the humble person than in all the really religious prideful people. And that's actually not what the scripture says. The scripture says people who are already righteous. Oh, I don't know how mad, I don't wanna go too deep into that because I, yeah. When you come to Heart of the City and hear us constantly returning to the simple gospel and you hear us constantly providing opportunities for people to surrender their lives to the Lord in a corporate setting. And if, only if, if I'm not preaching to you, I'm not preaching to you, don't get offended. If I'm not talking to you, I'm not talking to you, okay? If, if you find 
that there is a murmur and a complaint inside of you that says, I just don't know if I feel fed here. I know none of you never have that thought. I mean, you know. I know I've never had that thought. I mean, come on, let's be real, guys. Let me exhort you for a minute, Christian. If you are a born-again believer in Jesus, you have been equipped with the word of God set before you, the spirit of God living inside you, and a fork and a knife to feed yourself every day of your life. Okay? It is not, it is not just a, it's not a suggestion, it is a responsibility. Now, now, yes, bring balance, Seth. This is really unbalanced right now. Yeah, okay. I get it. All right, let's bring some balance. Are we going to stop preaching messages that apply to the lives of believers? Absolutely not. We, we, this is the, this is the fellowship of the believers. This is, this is the, what, what did I write? Oh, man. This is the gathering of the saints. That's what it is. Man, this is the gathering of the saints. And we are going to do our best to equip the saints for the work of the ministry because Ephesians chapter 4 says we've got to. Okay? But. When we are presented with the choice between the found being theologically satisfied, when we are presented with the choice between the found being theologically satisfied and the lost being found, we will leave the 99 in the open country to seek the lost sheep. We will leave the nine coins on the table to go turn the house upside down in search of that lost coin. Does that offend you right now? There's grace for that. <laughs> if you get frustrated by our parking lot, there's grace for that. If you get a little miffed when someone takes your Sunday seat or Saturday seat, there's grace for that. If you're mad that we don't often teach on eschatology, Calvinism, and penal substitution, there's grace for that. If you think that we're just too big, and if you can't meet with a pastor on three days' notice, we're not doing our job, there's grace for that. There's grace. Seriously, there's grace. There's grace. Totally. There's grace. Think some things are frustrating, some things are annoying. But let me ask you something. What if the grocery store is the earth? I see you. You're trying, to, you're trying to rob me of this dramatic moment. I'm, I'm, I will find you. And what if the parent diligently seeking his lost kid is God? And what if we are the employees that he is talking to? What if, what if you're the security guard? Will he find us ready to drop everything and join the search? Or will he find us complacent? and distracted by lesser things. I'm not asking those questions to, oh, it's time already. Holy, oh boy. Here we go. Here we go. I don't ask these questions to beat you up because guess what? I've been there. Do you know how many times I've been distracted with lesser things? Do you know how many times I've been sideswiped by the Holy Spirit going, you know this is about people, right? You know this is about people coming into the kingdom, right? So I'm, not, I'm, I'm asking those questions in order to set up an invitation. So we want to invite you to a few things. This is the application part of the sermon, for those of you who do like sections. I'm a little bit administrative and kind of, so I like sections. We want to invite you today to join us in being occupied and captivated by seeking and saving the lost. Invitation is open, you are invited. We wanna invite you to look at weekend gatherings a little bit differently. Not only is it a time for fellowship and spiritual renewal for yourself, but a time when you can be a part of welcoming people into the kingdom of God. We wanna invite you to take ownership of this community and see yourself as a host in this house every weekend. Not a visitor. What does a host do? Washes dishes. What does a host do? Gives up their seat. Doesn't go, when is that food going to be done? If a host asks that, 
man, we got a problem. <laughs> Maybe instead of sneaking out at the end today, when it's time for the salvation altar call, because you don't think that applies to you, and you want to get out of the parking lot that is annoyingly full, Maybe just stick around today and ask God how he would use you in that moment to minister to someone. Maybe instead of only coming to weekend gatherings when either you feel like super empty and you need to be filled or guilty, you should come every weekend that you possibly can because God just might want to use you to radically transform somebody's life. What if we looked at weekend gatherings differently? What if we looked at it that every person sitting in these seats who is saved is equipped and called and ready to minister. Now, we have, we're very thankful for our staff and we have a great team that God has brought, but the reality is we can't do it alone. You know why? Because my, I don't have your story. I cannot tell your testimony. I can't. And if I tried, it would sound so phony and no one would wanna hear it. And people would be like, we're getting out of here quick. I can't tell your testimony. Only you can share your story. I don't know who you know. I don't have the spheres of influence that you have, and I probably never will. I don't have the relationships that you have, and I probably never will. Let me tell you, never underestimate the power of an invitation. I mean that in more ways than one. I'm not just saying invite people to church, although invite people to church, y'all. There is power when you present the gospel, and you're going, me present the gospel? Isn't that for preachers? No, that's for everybody. (laughs) There's power when you present the gospel and when you invite someone into this surrender to Jesus. There is power when you invite someone to come be a part of a community and be in the communal presence of God. That power is in you. This is, not, this is not a motivational speech. This is, this is, please start reading scripture this way. Well, you know, if your answer to me, well, <laughs> I just don't have a passion for evangelism. It's not my gift. First of all, I'm not sure that the Bible has a gift of an evangelism. Um, I, I think what people are usually referring to is Ephesians chapter 4 the role of an evangelist, but it specifically says equip the saints for the work of the ministry. I'm convinced that an evangelist in that context is one who trains evangelists. Stephen introduced himself today as evangelist Stephen, not because he preaches the gospel to people. That makes, you know what that makes you because you preach the gospel to people? A disciple, a follower of Jesus, a Christian. He introduced himself as an evangelist because he has an impartation to I think of the word budding, but I think that that is not like budding, but he, he, has the, he has the ability, he has the gift to replicate evangelists. I went, on the, I went out on the streets with him sometime, a week or something ago, and I'm telling you, I'm, I'm gonna stop talking about that. We have all been commissioned to make disciples. We have all been commissioned to preach the good news, and I know this might sound harsh, But if you're not passionate about seeing the lost saved, I really don't think it's a gifting problem. I think it's a knowledge problem. I'm not calling you ignorant because I'm not talking about this kind of knowledge. I'm not talking about just knowing why seeking and saving the lost is important and knowing how to do it. I'm talking about intimate knowledge of the heart of God. I'm talking about gnosko. Another Greek word, that's two in one day. It is a word, and my dad talked about it a little bit last week. It implies firsthand experience, closeness, even to be used as a euphemism in the scriptures, not just in romance novels, but in the scriptures for sexual intercourse. It is not like knowing a fact. It's nothing like that. It's like knowing a spouse. What I'm saying is that to truly know God is not only to receive the salvation of God. To truly know God is not to only receive the salvation of God, but to catch the very heart of God. Because when we catch catch the heart of God, we can no longer be satisfied with simply consuming his benefits. We are compelled to share them. 
compelled. I would even go so far as to say that one cannot know God intimately without a stirring to see others know God intimately. If you know him like I know him, he will not leave you without a stirring. He won't. It's not a gifting thing. I, the more you know him, the more desperate you will be to see others know him. I read earlier from John 17. I want to reflect on that too. And this is eternal life. That they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. In other words, this is the main thing. There is nothing that is more consequential than this. That they know you. That they know God. So we know it's important, but what does it look like? He goes on to say, O righteous Father, even though the world does not know you, I know you, and these know that you have sent me, and I made known to them your name, and I will continue to make it known that the love with which you have loved me may be in them, and I in them. Now, Jesus is saying a lot in that statement, and I'm not going to try to sum it all up, but I do think that part of what he is saying is that to know God is to take on the love of God and to have Jesus personified in us. That is... Say, to know God is to be like God. To know God is to care about what he cares about. To know God is to love what he loves, to hate what he hates, to say what he says, to chase what he chases. <laughs> so when we invite you to join us in our passion for the lost, it's kind of a, it's kind of a trick invitation. Because what we're actually inviting you to do is to pursue more intimate relationship with God for yourself and in turn, as a result, let the overflow of that intimacy be the source of your ministry. So I'm going to say that again. I'm going to say that again. When we invite you into a passion to see the lost saved, we are more so inviting you to pursue intimate relationship with God for yourself and that in overflow from that, in overflow from that, that would be the source of your ministry. We're not, we're not asking you to lead people to a well before you have first tasted. That's not what we're asking you to do. What we're asking you to do is to drink from a well and find that it is so stinking good that you cannot help yourself but bring others to it. Amen. You hear that? We're not asking you to, come, to bring others to the well before you've tasted of the well. That's a little sketchy. Here's this well I never drank from. You want to try it? Might be good. Might, might kill you. We're asking you to taste and then realize that it is a taste that cannot be held in secret. So how can we do this? How can we know God in such a way that it would compel us to see other people know God? So I'm going to share a few points, but I really don't want them to be taken as bullet points, um, like in a class. Um, I'm going to share from my personal experience. I really, really do like to attach everything when I'm preaching to Scripture, and I really believe that these themes are all very, very in Scripture, but I just need to share a little bit of my story with you, and I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna leave that with you. So this is not so much a teaching as it is, here's how I've got to know God, and you might wanna try it. Is that okay? Okay. The first thing is recognize and, and acknowledge his nearness all the time. Cast your affections, this is all one. Cast your affections and your attention on him constantly. Realize that he is, his presence is just a moment of awareness away. And don't forget that he hangs out in your unscripted praises. You want to taste the presence of God when you're at work? Thank you. He's there. He's enthroned. He hangs out. He inhabits your tehillah, your unscripted praise. That's the first one. Second one, have conversations with him all day long. Don't limit, it, don't limit it to like, this is my little prayer time. No, have a prayer time. 
There's a beautiful thing about the secret place. We need the secret place. But have conversations with him all day. Tell him what's on your heart. This is so simple. Tell him what's on your heart. Ask him what's on, his, on, on your heart, on his heart, and invite him to align your heart with his heart. I'm gonna say that again. Tell him what's on your heart. He wants to know. He wants to know. He, he's not afraid of your complaints. He's not afraid of your crying to him. He's a good daddy. He wants to know what you're feeling. But after you tell him what you're feeling or before, whatever, ask him what he's going through. Ask him what he's feeling. And then go, okay, I'm trying to get a picture of what you're feeling because our God has emotions. To say our God doesn't have emotions is not scriptural. And then once you've, you know, had your, you've done your, your happies and your crappies with God. <laughs> ask him, say, God, okay, can you make my heart like your heart? Can you make my heart like your heart now? I think I, I think I heard what your heart is. I told you what my heart is. Can you make mine like yours? Third, hide, hide his word in your heart. Reading plans are great, but they're usually not around when the enemy comes like a flood. We're not called to just consume the word of God. We're called to meditate on it. What I mean by that is we're called to chew and swallow and regurgitate and repeat and chew and swallow and regurgitate and repeat until you taste something that you've never tasted before. Now I know that has a gross element to it, feel me, but feel me, but feel me until you've tasted something you've never tasted before. That's what meditation is. And I'm not just talking about the Logos, I'm talking about the Rhema, and my, I'm primarily talking about the Bible, yes, but I'm also talking about the prophetic word. If you got a prophetic word at the sound, don't just tuck it in your pocket and go, Lord, waiting for you to see that come. You take hold of that word, you chew on it, you swallow it, you regurgitate it, and you repeat until you taste something you haven't tasted before. You claim that promise over your life. Fourth. Live in covenant relationship with his people. Go deep with other believers. If you're not going deep enough with believers that they could hurt you, you're not going deep enough. If that's how you do friendship, I'm, I'm going to get just close enough to where they could really hurt me and then I'm going to back out. Then you haven't gone deep enough. I can't hang out there. Live with a 70 times 7 mentality. What do I mean by that? Peter goes, hey, Jesus, so like... If my brother like sins against me seven times, I have to forgive him, up to seven times. And he goes, Peter, I don't say seven times, I say 70 times seven. And by the way, when I say 70 times seven, I'm adding to scripture now, but I'm just telling you what, what we see when he, when he says 70 times seven, what it really would lead us to believe what he's saying is, Peter, I'm not saying seven times, I'm saying stop counting. Stop counting, Peter. That kind of relationship that says, yeah, we've been through a lot. You've hurt me so many times. I've hurt you so many times, but I'm not going anywhere. I'm not going anywhere. Intimacy is cultivated in the secret place, but understanding is honed in community. What do I mean by that? It's not just a one, it's not just a one liner. I mean something. So it's so important for us to have the secret place. We have to, to, to get close to God and to have those intimate moments with God. It's so important. It's, it's, it's incredibly important. You cannot live without it. You cannot do the Christian life without intimacy, without the secret place. But you also cannot do the Christian life without community. Because if all you have is intimacy and no understanding, I'm telling you, you are going to end up with some jacked up beliefs. You might be like, oh, I walk so closely with the Lord. And all of a sudden, you know, one day you're just this much degrees off from what the Lord's actual plan is. And then you're this and what his actual word is. And all of a sudden, you're up on the mountain and you have completely abandoned orthodox belief because just me and Jesus. And maybe you weren't hearing him as good as you thought you were. Community brings understanding. Iron sharpens iron. John 17, 23 says that they may become perfectly one so that the world may know that you sent me and love them even as you love me. Okay. Our relationship with one another is the proof in the pudding that Jesus was who he says he was. We are the proof. Our oneness, our closeness, our love for one another is what preaches to the world, yeah, it's real. Yeah, he wasn't just a good teacher. He was the son of God. 
And he also says, and that it's like he's saying, and that they, and that you love them like you love me. You want people to know that God loves them? Love other believers. Okay. Last one, step out of the boat. I'm referring to, of course, Peter when Jesus calls him out in the water. But what I'm saying is, is, is walking by faith. God partners with our faith. This is, I really wish I could spend more time on this, but I cannot. I cannot. He partners with our faith. We need to walk in simple obedience. When you hear the still small voice, you go. Because when we walk in simple obedience, we become more familiar with the voice. We become, more, we become more familiar with the sound, and then we are more confident in what he is saying. Let me give you an example. So you might hear, son, go tell that person that I love them. And you're going, that is so generic. That Of course you love them. And he says, son, go tell them that I love them. And you go, but if you're obedient that time, who's to say the next time he doesn't go, hey, son or daughter, go tell her that I see her daughter who is struggling with cancer and that I'm bringing healing to her body. Yeah. The Bible is very clear. He who is faithful with the small things will be faithful with the great things. Simple, generic, if you want to call it, I don't think it's generic, but generic obedience, and you wait, with, with, you wait for what he will entrust you with if you will steward the nugget. I'm telling you. It's a mysterious thing, but, the, but when you walk in obedience, you, you actually understand him better. You, you, you listen, you act, and then you, you recognize his voice better. You listen, you act, and you recognize. Wait, how does that work? Because usually when I, if I just want to recognize someone's voice better, I just need to listen to more of their voice. Well, yes, that's true, but a part of listening to his voice is obeying because a lot of times his voice looks like do something. If you want to hear it more, you got to do it more. And you hear it and you do it and you hear it and you do it. And all of a sudden people are like, wow, why does Pastor Bob have such great words of knowledge? Because he's been listening and acting for 40 years. Yeah. He's been stewarding anything he'll get. He'll steward it. You know? Okay. All right. You guys want to stand? Cool.